News Live with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV One. And a very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live. My guest this evening is uh, a member of the National Executive uh, Committee of the NPP, of which, of course, the JVP is a component member. And uh, he's none other than, all, uh, actually, all the way from Trinko, I must add that too, um, Arun Hemachandra. Very good evening to you, Arun, and welcome to the program. Very good evening to you. Um, some months ago, in Sinhalese, they would say to me, JVP got a rallak. Well, what's happened to this rally, to this wave? What's happened to it? Why has it gone down? It's kind of disappeared, has it? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this beautiful show. So, straight away answering to your question, the rally is still there and rally is developing rapidly. We had a fabulous May Day parade. Mm. And then no other parties could match to that. And overall, we had a very massive participation. And on the other hand, we are winning almost every cooperative society elections. Now, for example, today also I got a few results. Uh, almost 100% of the seats have been captured. There are many places that we are winning very rapidly. And we are having very successful electoral conventions. And we are having very successful uh, public rallies. So this is the only party that is having the green signal among the public. So we are free to go to the public, we are free to talk to the public and we are free to uh, contest elections and you know people are accepting us rapidly. So, But, but do you feel that uh, like uh, others as well, do you feel that you are being held back as a party? Yeah definitely because uh, we were expecting for an election We prepared our force uh, to face an election because democratically uh, this is the best way to capture the power. So we were preparing our force in order to face an election. But uh, unfortunately, this president is not in favor of that. Mm. And definitely we were prepared to give that system change that the country was expecting, anticipating. And uh, just because we are winning this election, he had done all his best to postpone the election. in an unruly manner. What are you saying? Are you saying that this president, this president is not in favor of democracy? Well, uh, they may manipulate the terms whenever that is, you know, uh, favorable to them. But that's not in, in Yeah, in, in the beginning he that's said... That's majoritarian. You know, yeah, exactly, because in the beginning he said he came to save the constitution. Yeah, yeah. Right, so that's why he had to take oaths as the president, and you know he was talking various things. Mm. But to see now, where is the democracy? They are doing all those expenditures. They are doing all you know lavishly spending everything. They are having their foreign trips, everything. But the people's democratic rights have been deprived. So whenever it is favorable to them, they make use of that opportunity, and whenever it is not favorable to them, they deprive people's right and their entire their exclusive. expectation is to stay on that seat. But, uh, Arun, isn't this true of every single government that we've had in Sri Lanka since democracy? They all come there and they appear to act per pro, for and on behalf of themselves and not of the people. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, especially after introduction of this uh, executive presidency. Yeah. And, and even J.R. Jayavadana said that in the beginning itself. Yeah. Uh, except, you know, making a female into a male or male into a female, he could do everything. Yeah. So it's basically, it's a power greed position. Right. So all the presidents who sat on that executive president seat have misused that seat. And they have made people, you know, fools continuously. So this executive presidency is also one of the main reasons for the devastating status of this country. So, do, do you think that actually, uh, my, my next question actually after this initial one was going to ask you, you know, where, what happened to the waves of support that the MPP appeared to have? And you, you kind of answering this. But my second question was going to be, why do the people seem hardly concerned anymore? Are they fed up? They've been held back so much. The, the uh, successive governments are not delivering on anything. They make empty promises, you know, 
oh, we'll have this for you, this for that. It's almost like somebody saying, look, we'll have water on your table. And you get there and there is no water and you've got a very hot curry to eat, you know, and you're, you know what's going to happen to you. You're going to be on fire. So do you think that these successive repetitive actions by every government and the usually split opposition, the opposition also has a job. The opposition should be, should be united in, in their opposition to the government, but they are not. Every now so and then you see various parties will support the, uh, the government of the day. They are given little gifts, if you like, of deputy ministerships or ministerships or chairmanships and so on and so forth. Most of those uh, chairmen are there merely for the ride. Uh, evidenced by the state of our state-owned enterprises, most of them are loss-making. If they were working for a commercial outfit, uh, the board would have kicked them out a long time ago. Definitely. So, do you think that the people are no disinterested now because of this continuous lying, lying and damned lies, as they said some time ago? Well, uh, we could put it in this way. People are looking forward to a better opportunity to show their anger. Mm. The government is anticipating the people to get onto the streets and, you know, take violence uh, on their hands and, you know, so, so the government also could play a different role in, you know, prohibiting protest and, you know, they could, you know, Im implement uh, emergency law and things like that. Yeah. But then again, it's our duty also to keep the people, you know, uh, kind of, you know, to keep the people informed, but also we should prevent the people taking, we should make the people prevent taking violence on their hands. Mm. So in that basis, as a political party, as a responsible political party, we have done our level best to keep the people in a calm state. But whenever there is an election, whenever that democratical rights will be given to the people, people will do whatever they are supposed to do. So there is no change on that because the people have taken the decision long back. People got onto the streets, they, they chased that government, so they were waiting for a fresh mandate to be presented. But actually they, they've been let down because although they shouted and they, they screamed and they danced and they drew art and became creative and so on and um, managed to convince one man, the president at the time, that uh, they didn't want him and so he just took off. Um, they, they then have a president, the, these protesters and so on have now find themselves at the wrong end side of the law. Some of them were actually initially being held under the PTA. And it sounds suspicious, but if you look, examine the use of the PTA to charge people, and then you take the timeline and you superimpose the IMF agreement and you set it on this, you will find that all of a sudden this PTA has been put on hold. I'm not complaining that it has been, but all I'm saying is that it looks like, and then they try to bring in this anti-terrorism uh, law, which seemed to be some people on this program told us that it is far worse than the PTA. It's draconian, yeah. So, so the people, uh, although they, they um, shouted and screamed and protested, which is their right to protest, have now found that they can't. Do you think that they've stopped doing all this? Because not only that they are fed up with the lies that they have been given and being, the people being held back, but do you think that the economic situation is so bad that honestly the people have no time to support uh, to go and protest no this is actually like uh, it's like this now in the beginning this is also one of the reasons why we said the mandate of the people should be renewed so we wanted an election as early as possible so when Gotabi Rajapaksa left his seat we wanted an election as early as possible so the people's mandate could be renewed because we expected all these things to take place. But on the other hand, we had to be really careful 
we have to be really careful and we should prevent people taking violence on their hands as i told b- before we are waiting for an election and we prepared the people also to face an election so only by that way we could i mean bring a permanent solution to this problem mm. because the mandate should be renewed and with a new mandate the new government will have an opportunity to work accordingly and we believe we can form a government with the new mandate and we believe that we can provide uh, solutions for most of the problems because you are from trinco and but you had your high education in kandy at that wonderful school there at trinity uh, but because mainly because you are from from the east from mm. trinco do you think that the people there are ready for a remarkable change as in to dis to discount the main stream parties which are <coughs> the derivatives of the UNP so the UNP the SJB or the derivatives of the original SLFP into various other things that includes SLPP now do you think that the people in that area are ready to make a new change out of the box let's vote the npp in what indication do you have if that's the case yeah definitely there is a very big opportunity because all these governments all these pa- all these mainstream parties that were ruling this country has been cheating the people throughout and we do believe that uh, the people sh- could start a new dialogue with us and and we are i mean practically we are facing lot of you know positive signs so we are talking to the people directly we are talking to the people without any agents we are talking to the people without any proxies so we are talking to the people and we are finding out what is the real problem that they have mm. and there is a very vital opportunity for us to play a good game there so we believe that you know the changes you know near just like the other parts of the country in the east also there will be a change in in, in do, you, do you think the people in the east have the, the tamil speaking people do you think they have got fed up of the promises and the undertakings made by the so called main party from over there like say the Tamil National Alliance actually yeah i mean uh, we could uh, talk about tna and also we could talk about the other uh, muslim uh, political parties yes indeed so we could uh, put it in two different ways one is the mainstream government and the other thing is you know the, the brokers that they play a big role uh, by you know cheating the people uh, by being a part of the government mm. so the people are very angry with those you know agents because they say now at, at at the moment the people are very you know fond of us they talk to us and we had very successful campaign in the east and they invite us I mean, to organize more and more campaigns mm. and especially what they are expecting is they want to have a direct contact with npp and they expect us not to take these brokers or these agents along with us for any of the campaigns so mm. they say without them this will be a better place so they are they are, i mean the people are really ready to work with us so uh, arun uh, how communal minded are the voters when it comes to casting their vote would they would the muslim voter in the east vote only for um, a muslim party and would the rest of the tamil speaking people uh, the tamil people would they only vote for a tamil party and isn't that being communal i mean people are really understanding the truth because uh, for example in the last uh, parliament election the biggest campaign among the muslim community was against uh, the former president gotabi rajapaksa and and you know they described him as a racist and in in order to defeat him they wanted the muslim uh, seats to be increased but where and if you see in the parliament some muslim members they had put a uh, i mean a slogan or whatever a, a kind of a badge saying that say no to 20th amendment wherein they voted for the 20th amendment hmm. so i mean the people's mandate have been kicked simply speaking hmm. so in that uh, instance what we could understand is you know these uh, political agents hmm. were always betraying the people's <coughs> mandate and they were making use of their 
I mean, they were making use of the situation for their own benefit. So in that case, there is a very big chance for us to work with the people in the East and North and also in the upcountry. And uh, we are making use of that and definitely there will be a change in the near future. It's very interesting talking to you, Arun Hermachandra, uh, member of the NPP, the national uh, and also member of the National Executive Committee of that party. Uh, we'll take a peek at this evening's headlines and come back to you and discuss this further <coughs> with Arun Hemachandra. See you on the other side of the break. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV One. Chinese national who was released on the letter of State Minister Arundhika Fernando and later arrested is a wanted man in China. Immigration officials to deport him soon. Venerable Rajangane Saddharatanathera, who was arrested for disturbing religious coexistence, remanded. Lawyers go to bribery commission seeking inquiry into Ali Sabri Rahim's wealth. Rupee appreciates against the US dollar and ADB approves 350 million US dollars for Sri Lankan economic stabilization program. When a heart attack strikes, every minute makes the difference between life and death. With the right care and treatment at the hand of the most skilled surgeons and medical professionals. With the perfect environment for recovery. Darden's Heart Center. Dedicated to you. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali on <coughs> TV One. And welcome back to Newsline Live. I'm in conversation with member of the NPP, Mr. Arun Hemachandra, uh, who, by the way, hails from Trincom Lee. Um, Arun, tell me, isn't it being communal when uh, you have uh, minor members of the minorities voting only for very specific, those little parties, whereas those parties can never make, uh, make up government. And then so those little parties are forced to get, jump into bed with one, whoever wins the election. Isn't that being communal? When is this going to change? Do we need minority parties? Well, we should have a party that recognizes the rights of minorities, I mean, equal to the other, other, other people in the country. Mm. So what we feel is, I mean, rather than people negotiating with whoever the agents, mm. it's better for the people to negotiate with us directly. So we have started that campaign. We are talking to the people directly. We are looking uh, for their problems and we are addressing their problems. So in that basis, what we feel is throughout the history, these parties have been, I mean, betraying the people. So in that mean, what we expect from the people is to think out of the box. And there's a very big opportunity here. Mm. And, and we are focusing in a, I mean, we are, we are focusing in, in making a better country with equality and justice for everybody. And in that mean, we invite every citizens, especially from North, East and the up country to join hands. What are your, um, um, what are your grassroots um, comrades from the grassroots? What are they reporting back? What are the main issues they're talking to you back? Well, uh, the economic crisis, you know, it's devastating. Yeah. People are losing jobs. People, those who are in, living in the villages are returning back. And uh, the farmers are having a very hopeless future. The cost of production has gone up drastically. Mm -hmm. And especially if you take the fishermen, yeah. they also have the equal, uh, e e equivalent problems. Okay. Because uh, there is a very big problem with the kerosene oil. The prices have gone up. Yeah. All their day-to-day, um, -day, um, the fishing gear prices have gone up. And what about the so, tourism industry over there? Yeah, the tourism industry is not booming as expected because, you know, we lack a lot of skilled um, laborers, which the government is not 
uh, interested on focusing. Is because that because this, the trained people have all left? Yeah, all left because you know most of the industries are leaving the country. And then recently also I, I, I read an article saying that one of the top uh, garment companies leaving because you know the, the, the skilled laborers uh, are leaving the country and then they have a very uh, serious shortages of staff. <clears throat> so likewise, uh, if we take the youth population in the country, they are living hopelessly. They are living hopelessly. And then I think we should address this part more and more because, uh, I mean, a hopeful youth population only could bring some kind of a future to, the, to a nation. So in that uh, context, if we see, the youth population in the country is always thinking about leaving this country. So if we have that kind of a youth population, how can we go forward? What kind and, of and, and, what, what, and, and, and Mr. Faraz, like, what kind of steps have the government taken to hold this population in the country? They have no future. They have well, no the jobs. With the economy shrinking, uh, so therefore we've got a little bit more petrol to play around with now. Yeah. Uh, but what's the point? Uh, people aren't turning enough money. My, my, my I mean, wage is down by one third. I mean, to s tell that in Singhala, they said, you know, we will make a inna hitana ratak, a livable country. Hmm. But now they are telling us to leave the country. The minister is, you know, he's... What kind of brain drain do you guys get out in the East? Well, uh, many professionals are leaving. Now, there are two, three different categories that we could categorize. Hmm. One is, you know, the normal unskilled laborers. Hmm. The other part is the skilled laborers. Hmm. And the other part, is the I mean intellectual part. Mm. Many doctors, lawyers, engineers, bankers are leaving the country. And I talked to a, a couple of doctors mm. and I, I asked them what's the reason for you all to leave. And they said, we cannot live in this country because this country does not provide a vital future for our children. Everyday kidnappings are taking place. Drugs is everywhere. And, and, and Mr. Faraz, there's a link between, I, I, I read several journals, there's a link between poverty and drug use. There's a, there's a very close contact with, between uh, drug abuse how and... Ba how bad is the problem in the East? Yeah, it's dangerous. Many youths have been addicted to drugs. And, and so, so many, many professionals, many intellectuals, they are forced to leave this country in order to make a secure future for their children. What about the, uh, I have many questions, thank you very much by the way, um, but w one of the other questions is, what about women's representation at the NPP? Yeah, we have a fairly good women's representation and that is one of the vital uh, points that we have. Mm. Uh, there are many professionals working with us and especially what we could assure is, you know, there is a miscontext of women, pop women participation in politics in Sri Lanka. Mm. Because uh, just because a person is a woman and just because a person is from a political background, that will not give a person eligibility to get into politics. Mm. But throughout the history, what we have seen is, if the husband was a parliamentarian, the wife is eligible to get into the parliament. If the father was a minister or something, the, the daughter has the eligibility to get into the parliament. Mm. That is their right. That is different. You know, in, in mainstream political parties, that may be normal. But we provide a very good women leadership to the country. Mm -hmm. We have women from the grassroots. We have intellectual women. And we have the women participation in the politics without any expectations to make money out of politics. Can I ask you, uh, uh, thank you for explaining that. At least the feminist brigade out there will be uh, happy the question has been raised and that you've given an answer. But do you know this split divided opposition. Isn't it going to be, won't it be the cause of a potential return to power of a Rajapaksa centric government again? I, I don't just like what happened at the, I don't think during so. the Apalani government. I don't think so. Because the people are fed up with the opposition also. Right. The people are fed up with the main opposition also. Because the main opposition is, you know... What do you think the, is their main failure? They have many reasons for their failure. They do not have a policy. Their main orientation is to protect their party and their colleagues. Mm. So in that basis, you know, they don't have a plan. They don't have a policy. They just blabber everything, you know, what they think about. But 
I mean, when the people are given with a better option now, mm. and that is NPP, the people are ready to choose NPP. So we do not worry anything about the opposition. I mean, the main opposition, they talk something else to the public. In the parliament, they do something else. You know, for example, uh, when it comes to selling the oil tanks and everything, their unions were in favour of not selling the tanks. But when it comes to the parliament voting, they were voting in favour of selling the tanks. Mm. So they show some different face to <coughs> their public. I need to, thank you, but I need to interrupt you and ask you yeah. this. Um, because several people have asked this and, and it's also one of the questions. Does the NPP believe in a cost recovery mechanism for all public sector utilities, including education, with a special obligation towards the vulnerable families? Why can't the government and will the NPP, if in government, make utilities, including medical education based on an ability to pay rather than this one size fits all free education for everybody? Why should it be like that? Well, uh, it's a good question. And uh, I believe that, you know, we should discuss about this matter in a deeper manner. But to put in a nutshell, the requirement of budget allocation for education in this country is 6% yeah. from the GDP. Yeah. But how many percentage are we allocating? Perhaps two. Yeah, some, but you know, a little less, so little more, I mean, more or less 2%. Yeah. So I would take a different drift, to, I mean, to answer this question. We should consider education as a right, but not a commodity. The moment that we start allocating 6% minimum. I'm not telling by just by allocating 6% we cannot find an answer to this. Mm. Just by, I mean, the moment we start allocating at least 6%, mm. things will start changing. So in that basis, what we feel is... But do you, do you as a concept, do you believe that free education should be for everybody or for those who really deserve it because they don't, their finances won't allow them to pay free education should be available to be i mean it, that should be available to everybody right but people can have their own choices if they do not want to go to a government school they can go to a private school that's their problem mm. if they do not want to go to a government hospital they can go to a private hospital but if the government schools and if the government hospitals are functioning well people also have their own choices so we cannot categorize people in that. It but what's your take on people on this brain drain? You know, people come in, they get educated for free, and then they leave the country. I mean, they are leaving the country under this system. When there is an NPP rule in this country, the entire system will be changed, and we will make a livable country for those intellectuals. They will stay in this country. There are many countries that, you know, has been changed rapidly soon after a political transformation. Last question, because we've got one more minute. Do you think or do you believe that at the NPP, that the NPP is committed to look at every community as equal citizens? Definitely. We should create a Sri Lankan nationality. The problem in this country is the rulers have been dividing the country into different, different, different nationalities. Even now, if you take a birth certificate and see, it, it says Sinhalese, Sri Lankan Tamil, Indian Tamil, more Malay. So we should come up as Sri Lankans together. Only with that, only by building up a national unity in this country, only by bringing up Sri Lankan nationality, we can move forward as a country. Without that, we don't have any choices. And are you saying that it is the NPP who can deliver just what you Definitely. said. Definitely. Aaron Hermachandra, thank you very much for being on Newsline Live. And that's the way it was on Newsline Live this evening. Take care. Have a great evening as much as you can. And, of course, God bless you all. It's now time for the Primetime News.